welcome to the Bradford Literature Festival. I'm Saima Aslam, the director of the festival, and it's my great pleasure to be hosting this event in conjunction with Speaking Volumes. It is a real pleasure to be working with Speaking Volumes again, particularly as this year is their 10th anniversary. BLF has had a really long-standing partnership with Speaking Volumes and the work that they do in bringing new and underrepresented voices to the fore in really new and exciting ways and in reaching and engaging diverse audiences is something that really chimes with BLF and is intrinsic to our values. The launch of this collection, their first anthology, um, is aptly entitled Not Quite Right For Us and it's a fantastic celebration of the way that they work and have done to date and it really encapsulates how they give a voice to writers who might not otherwise be heard. The collection is really beautiful and it spoke to me personally as well as linking to so many of the themes from the festival this year. Whether it's work, whether it's family or childhood, these are all the big themes that inform our lives and our daily experiences. The event that I'm really proud to introduce today um, will have writers speaking about the theme of love. At BLF we decided to choose this theme because this is the biggest human emotion. It underpins our experiences, it informs our daily life, it gives colour to everything that we do. And I think at the moment it is particularly important in the current context that we live in, both political and with all the events of the last 18 months. And given everything that we have gone through, there is nothing that can give me more pleasure than to welcome this very talented group who are going to speak to you about this theme. I hope you will enjoy this and I look forward to seeing you at other events. Thank you very much. Hello, Valava. My name is Selena Tusitala Nash. I am the former New Zealand Poet Laureate. 2017 to 2019. I'm an associate professor at the University of Auckland where I teach creative writing and Māori and Pacific literature. I'm a poet, an essayist and most recently um, a graphic novelist. I wrote my first poem at eight and published it in the local rag and you know the epiphany came about the power of writing when um, someone in my small hometown came up to me and said, you know, love that piece, love that poem. Um, and I just, I'd forgotten that I'd submitted it. And it was quite an extraordinary thing for me to think about how the words that were inside my head um, were suddenly floating out there in the world and touching other people and helping other people connect to their own feelings. And then I didn't really connect with poetry per se, um, until I published my first collection of poetry in 2009. I'd gone through university studying it and studying other people, writing poetry, and had always felt this pull, but a complete lack of confidence. Being vulnerable with the line has helped me uh, connect with people and helped people connect with me. Um, so much so that I became um, known as the poets people in terms of what I did with the Poet Laureateship. I simply tell it how I see it and how I feel it. Cape Kidnapper sits on the east coast of the North Island of Aotearoa, New Zealand. It is notoriously named after an incident that occurred in 1769 during Cook's first voyage. Tayata, the Tahitian servant of Tupaya, Cook's navigator and interpreter, was seized by some Māori during a botched trading attempt. We don't know what went wrong, only that Tayata was taken as collateral. Cook's response was certainly the worst kidnapping retrieval plan ever. Cannonball the waka and everyone in it, Tayata included, except he jumped waka and escaped. Cape Kidnappers is also the site of one of the country's most renowned luxury lodges. I've been invited to speak to 30 Australians, wealthy lovers of literature, 
on a leg of their literary tour. After gourmet mussel fritters, soft venison with roast beetroot and feta salad, and tempura vegetables on the side, my talk and performance go down as smoothly as the cloudy bay bubbles. I stand against a dramatic panoramic view of Temata Peak and the slow wending Tuki Tuki River. They laugh, some cry, there's a flurry of questions. My message, to tell your tale or someone else will, or won't. The perfect balance of sweet and tart to finish off the meal. When I board the coach back to the lodge, I find myself in the midst of a seat bidding frenzy. Sit with me, there's room here. Sit next to me, my dear, I need your advice. Another woman across the aisle frowns at this blatant physical redirection. The woman pats my arm. Now, you're the expert and I need your advice. You said, tell your tale or someone else will. Or won't. Well, I have a tale, but I don't know if I should tell it. The woman tells me about her visit to the Serengeti five years earlier. She and her husband are seasoned travellers, preferring tailor-made, personalised tours to experience the real life of a place. They want to experience this beautiful and culturally rich world in a genuine way. Their guide took them to a Maasai village. She leans into me, gripping my arm like an old girlfriend. I was walking through their camp. And then I see her from behind, the most beautiful, statuesque woman in front of me, wearing the most wondrous cloak. Its beads were swaying with the regal toing and froing of her body. The colours, the textures against her shining black skin were mesmerising. I still see it now so vividly. The colours, the rhythm, hypnotic. The woman now has both hands swaying in front of her, mimicking the slow sachet of this cloak, her eyes round with worship. I wanted to reach out and touch it, to touch her. Instead, I found myself putting my hand on her shoulder. The woman spins around, bringing her brood to a halt. Her four small sons look up at me. Oh, she was just. So beautiful. I bite down on my lip. Before I know it, I'm saying, can I buy your cloak? I bite down harder. Of course, our guide had to interpret. I've never offered to buy things off people's backs, but this cloak, it was magical. I had no choice. The Maasai woman did though. Not for sale, she replies through the interpreter. The woman leans into me, her hand vice gripping my knee. I say through the interpreter, oh, of course, there's, there's no pressure. I didn't mean to offend. It's just that your cloak is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I just had this immediate physical response to it. It turned out that the intricately beaded animal skin was a wedding cloak and very old. Each bead symbolised a tribal marriage and is hand sewn into the skin. Older glass, stone or shell beads began higher up the cloak. More recent weddings were marked with shiny plastic beads lower down the back. The woman was permitted to take photos though of the Maasai woman of her cloak, of the beads shimmering on her back as she walked away, of her sons trailing behind her. Then I forgot completely about it, until the next day. The woman and her husband had just finished breakfast and were heading towards the tour car when she saw a tall, slim boy standing outside their hotel. She recognised him from the day before. She will sell he says to the interpreter. What made her change her mind, I ask? The interpreter told me that the money would pay the school fees for her children for two years. 
Well, I thought, anything to help. I've sent them care packages over the years. The woman shipped the cloak back to Sydney and placed it on a mannequin displayed in the drawing room. Behind it, she erected a framed photo of the Maasai woman wearing it. She wore it twice herself. For five years, she felt the joy of it every time she passed through the drawing room. Until the mould appeared. The Canberra restorer specialising in African artefacts couldn't believe what she had in front of her. The specialist, she knows her stuff, believe you me, told me how rare Maasai wedding cloaks are, especially one as pristine as this. She's never seen one as intricate, as old as this one, not even in museums. Frankly, she was shocked at how casually I'd shipped it across the country. The skin was drying out. It was no longer being worn daily, no longer absorbing the natural oils of human skin. Out of its natural environment, it began dying. I asked the restorer if I should return it to Africa. God, no. The restorer replied, there are only a handful of these in existence. We would lose it. Who would keep it for generations to come? You see my dilemma. Do I tell its tale? If I return it, who will ever hear it? Maybe it wants to go back to its owner. But how will I ever find her? It's my responsibility now. Well, what do you think? I inhale and tell her. The story. The woman who bought a cloak. We call ourselves the aunties. We are dames and officers of the New Zealand Order of Merit. We are mothers and sisters. We are doctors and artists, researchers and activists. We are students and corporate executives. We are leaders and supporters. We are old, we are young. We are 165 New Zealand women, and we are buying a cloak to place around the shoulders of our Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern. We want her to know that we are her tribe, that we've got her back. That's what aunties do. No special occasion, no event to be marked and strictly no press. Just arms around an extraordinary woman, leading at an extraordinary time, someone who embodies the zeitgeist of our nation, a country that prides itself on what its can-do, will-do farming Kiwi culture calls a number eight wire mentality, where a piece of wire can be bent to fix anything from a broken fence to a malfunctioning engine, a nation that does things differently post-Christchurch massacre and pre-COVID. The aunties recognise the deep strength, tenacity and high level of task switching required to lead this nation. Prime Minister Ardern is the 39-year-old mother of our nation and of a two-year-old daughter. She is only the second world leader to have given birth while in office. She is the first non-Muslim woman leader to wear a hijab and have her image projected on the tallest building in the world, the Burj Khalifa. She is the first New Zealand Prime Minister to use words such as kindness and care in public and to mean it, infusing these words into policy. As mothers, sisters, daughters, grandmothers and granddaughters, we imagine the cost. We each put $150 into the kitty to make Jacinda her own korowai, her own feathered Māori cloak. She wore a borrowed one for her visit to the Queen. This korowai will be woven for her by the master weavers Matikino Lawless and her daughter Christina Wirihana. They are weaving with the rarest of feathers, kiwi. All of us are present in spirit as each feather is stitched in. Hello everyone, um, 
My name is Amin Atik. Um, I'm a Yemeni Scouts writer, activist, performer, facilitator. Um, I also produce and manage uh, my own projects. Um, many, many hats uh, for def different occasions. Um, but I'm very lucky and fortunate enough to be able to grasp so many skills in a very short time of my career. So my work, uh, I, I have to start from the beginning. Because, um, you know, every story has a beginning and a middle and hopefully an ending. Um, and, you know, people ask me, when did you start writing poetry, Amina? Um, and it was only till this year when I worked with the Anthony Walker Foundation on a campaign to, you know, encourage uh, people of, uh, uh, you know, of colour, mixed and uh, black communities to report hate crimes, religious and um, race hate crimes. I realised I'd suppressed the memory um, that happened when I was 15 years of age. And what happened at 15 was I was unfairly convicted um, and we received a three-year criminal record. Um, and the reason being is because I was a victim of a hate crime. I didn't know at the time that I was, but I, I really thought it was really important to start here. Um, because when people ask me, why do you write? And I don't think it's why I write. It's, 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 it's what fueled me to write. And I think poetry was like, kind of like my way of, of navigating and controlling that narrative that I didn't get a chance to do at 15 years of age because I knew someone else had written that story for me. And that for me was, was a, it's my liberation. And I don't think people understand what that means when you hold it. It's huge, you know. Um, it made me understand who I am as a person, it made me understand. It became my outlet. Um, as you can tell, I'm getting a bit emotional. <laughs> um, and I'm getting emotional because I'm passionate about, you know, a lot of people think, you know, poetry is rhyme, it's words on a page, but sometimes it's more than that. And for me, it, it is, it's more than that. It, it's, it's a story that I'm able to control. You know, take an audience to a place that I want them to, to go to. Um, so yeah, so my pen became my sword. So when I was sent the brief by speaking uh, volumes to submit a poem, I looked at the brief and I said straight away, um, I said, I need to write about a memory. And the memory was, um, I was in uh, Arabic school, so I used to go to Arabic school on the weekend. I felt it quite threatening and very intimidating because I started to lose the language of Arabic. And that, uh, you know, and, and I started to blame my teacher for not teaching us properly, but what really, what that is, that is diaspora. This is what it means to be the diaspora. Because what happens is you start to integrate and you start to sacrifice one thing for the other or it starts to blend. And that's what I wanted to do in this poem and this is why I called it pilgrimage because when you travel from one place to another, it's a journey, but in some journeys we leave things behind and some we take things with us. So what is that transition from one place to another? you know, between survival and living. Thank you so much for listening. Um, and I hope that we can connect and do buy the anthology because it's great. And um, let me know what you think of my piece, uh, The Pilgrimage. We kissed at the border, but you stole my heart, offering it to Nejran. But I was too young to understand this warfare love story when my tongue is tied to the English home. But we lose ourselves in our peculiar summer pilgrimages to a place elsewhere. But only the diaspora, cross-legged children understand, slurring basic Arabic letters across the cabinet classroom. Your teacher, tall as you, pointing her nose upwards, 
never lose yourself in this place, even if you lose yourself. But these children, they dream of abstract checkpoints of stick men in uniform confessing to the moon with their flags stuck upright. We search for our home in our radical love letters across the English channel pushing the French waters when the lifeguard sleeps. We recreate the kiss of the border, rotted in abandonment, stuttering its national anthem it turns in its grave, and the invaders prowling in your summer journeys is a love story missing. So the school bell rings, the children unpack their tuna butties and smart price orange juice, speaking over each other in their second language, with their mouths full, they suck the life out of them straws, turning sideways. Hello, my name is Leonie Ross, and I've been a writer editor and teacher of creative writing for 30 plus years. I've been trying to write since I was a kid. I started off, as most of us do, with very bad poetry, but always short stories. I dreamt of being a novelist and began to publish long form in the 90s, publishing two novels, All the Blood is Red and Orange Laughter, in relatively quick succession. Then I got pretty lost in short story writing and teaching publishing shorts in the UK, US, Australia, Slovakia even. I made my way back to whole books finally in 2017 with Come Let Us Sing Anyway, my first short story collection, and my third novel, This One Sky Day, is out with Faber. I started out writing realism and I remain concerned with serious social themes of race and gender, body complexity and autonomy, violence, sexual assault, dark emotions. But increasingly I find surrealism, magic realism, horror, just plain oddness, incongruity, fantasy, that these things are the perfect vehicle for the serious ideas. And that joy, especially the joy of dispossessed or marginalised or misunderstood communities, is an important kind of revolution in and of itself. While, of course, we work to dismantle larger insidious institutions that hurt people. Diana hadn't intended to steal the knot out of the young woman's belly. She took the knot on a whim, up early, tiptoeing past her son Gabriel's bedroom, trying not to creak her hips or the floorboards, pulling on thick socks and bright blue wellies, smoothing her hair into a bun and stuffing it under one of Jonathan's snug olive green caps. It was Gabe's first time home from university and the first young woman he'd ever had to stay. There were so many things wrong with the thieving moment. Gabe's barely open bedroom door, Diana's inability to resist looking in at the sleeping couple, the stab she'd been feeling since yesterday afternoon. Stab, stab, stab since they'd arrived. She hadn't wanted to endure the sight of her son lying on his side, his shoulder bare in lemonade light, the rest of him mercifully tucked under the duvet, cupping a woman to his body. But she couldn't help staring, regardless. Diana knew dogs. She'd had so many. It was one of the reasons she'd gotten up for a morning walk for years. But their last dog, an old, soft Bichon Frise called Mr Walcott, had died last summer. They were certain to get another one, but Jonathan had been travelling, and Gabe had to be packed off to university, and a new puppy was a mammoth undertaking. Even a shelter midlife doggy would need such attention. Before she quite knew what she was doing... Diana clicked her right fingers and whistled low under her breath. Hey boy, hey boy. The knot wriggled delightedly. Diana scowled, perfectly ordinary Susan, who'd arrived at her house last night and lit a bomb under her entire existence. Diana saw that she'd carefully stored her engagement ring on the bedside table, close, so that she could seize it when she woke, 
jam it on her finger again, jam it into Diana's eye, both eyes like a hot needle. The knot whined. Come on, boy, softly patting her hip. The knot pulled itself free from Susan's abdomen like sticking plaster. Diana didn't stop to worry whether the young woman's internal organs were exposed to the cold air or bleeding. It would serve her right. They left the house together, not slipping joyfully down the rainy front steps, raindrops gathering on Diana's bifocals like tears. She pulled her coat tighter, the gold and green tattoo on her left shoulder glimmering under the porch light. She'd expected to be happy and welcoming the first time Gabe brought a girlfriend home. She wasn't a young mother, but she could be of help to a girl, she thought. Nurturing or wise. She might provide some kind of context, be helpful, introduce her around a bit, lunch or shopping, of course, and something more robust if Gabe married one day. As a family, they did a lot of philanthropic work, locally and abroad. She made the occasional speech. Recently, she'd done a debate for charity, arguing why it was unhelpful to talk about Africa when you were trying to help the particularity of Nigeria or Ghana. Diana had asked the cleaner to prepare the third bedroom for Gabe's arrival, the double ensuite, not the room with two single beds, something a diplomatic friend had suggested. She was determined to respect the couple's adulthood. But when she heard the crunching sound of her husband's car back from the train station, pulling into the gravel drive and settling in the garage, and the sound of talking and laughing, Diana felt unexpectedly weary and leaned her forehead against the cool, stippled kitchen wall before going out into the hall. She knew before she met the girl, she knew in her heart what was coming. She wished for the honest bounce of a dog around her ankles, so she and the stranger walking towards her could become entangled in the canine glee, in that way of dog lovers. Ah, he's a lovely one. What's his name, breed? Come here, lovely. How long you had him? Looks to be three or so? She had no idea whether or not Susan liked dogs. Susan had several tattoos and a silver nose ring, but they'd had the good sense to arrive without her engagement ring on show. Thinking back, Dinah was pretty sure that she was the only one who didn't know, on that cold, dogless doorstep, her husband seeking her eyes and smiling far too wide. Can Pa pick us up at the station? Gabriel had asked. Of course he wanted his father to talk about how to handle his mother. Mama won't like it. She'll be fine, Gabriel. Welcome, Diana said. Welcome, ah. Reached out to hug her tall, good-looking, creamy boy to her body. Gabriel with his always glittering black eyes. And then this Susan, her eyes glittering too, head up, back straight, smiling. The girl was not anxious at all. She reached out to clasp Diana's hands with her fat, black self, and she was just as calm as the lake down by the Peter Hunt Row, and near as tall as her son. Diana nearly drew back. The confident young woman's jeans were far too tight for this occasion, and she had clipped and sensible nails, and she was squeezing Diana's palms, almost as if she was welcoming her. Enter the first stab, stab of fury. Dinner was agreeable. She'd hired a local chef, a starter of sea bass and assorted bright greens, a white bean cassoulet with clams and braised pig trotter. Susan stared at the plump open clams on her plate, brow knit. Should she gesture her towards the fish cutlery, indicate the shells weren't edible? Surely not. Susan glanced up. Diana delicately placed a clam in her mouth so the girl could follow suit. Susan winked and mimicked her. They chewed together. Diana felt her tongue heavy in her mouth, rudderless. Mama, Gabriel said. He reached out for Susan's hand and squeezed it. When he was a little boy, he'd instinctively guarded the shyest child. Diana stole a glance at Jonathan, who was watching his son carefully. Mama, said Gabe, we, we, oh, it was we, 
was it? We. Susan beamed an oily, happy mass of tight clothes at her table. Later, making ready for bed, her husband could not stop smiling at Jack in the box. Diana stood by the nightstand, one hand on her hip, left foot tapping. Jonathan drew her into the thick duvet, soothing and stroking. She's good, Oleyam. Can you not see she is a good girl? She bit her lip not to cry. Of all evenings, now you choose to call me that? He stroked her face, the shoulder tattoo, fingers trailing. Sometimes I like to call you by the name your mother gave you, Di. She grunted. He was such an agreeable companion. Of her excellent taste in him, she was sure, if nothing else in this world. Even when other things were sinking, spraying, cracking, drowning, when she was fattened with tears. But he was wrong about this girl, this Susan, who looked her in the face, like she didn't know the pull of oceans. My name is Richard Georges. I'm from the British Virgin Islands. I was born in Trinidad and Tobago. I like to think of myself as a child of the Caribbean. Um, in my nine to five, I'm actually a, a president of a community college and I spend as much time as I can outside of that role um, with my lovely family and of course uh, writing. My work has largely been preoccupied with the various um, iterations or manifestations uh, of the natural world, primarily the sea, uh, but often you know, I, I get lost in the flora and fauna of this small place and, and think of, of the quite large and looming histories that, you know, co-inhabited with me. Um, you know, so I, I think I've been very focused on, on poetry uh, the past, you know, 10 years or so. But I think my writing routine really is a holdover from my, um, my graduate study because I've been, I've grown accustomed to you know, really blocking out, you know, large chunks of time in my working life and, and sort of like stealing, stealing time here and there to, um, to make progress on my, my thesis. And so I kind of developed a bit of a rhythm, um, you know, in my every day really, you know, say, well, you know, I would work, you know, two or three hours every night during the week. Um, and then I would block out, you know, sometimes as much of, let's say, the Saturday as I could, just to be, you know, deep as as I can in in the work, and I think that sort of ethic um, has really helped me to to be a reasonably productive, um, you know. And I, I think you know finding that kind of routine, you know. So you know, if you know. That certain kinds of environments and certain kinds of mindsets, certain kinds of music and routines inspire you, or, or you tend to be generative in those types of situations. It makes sense to place yourself, you know, deliberately uh, with intent um, into those spaces and those times and those mind states as much as as much and as often as possible um, to predispose you to create. So I'm, I'm quite. You know, honored to be uh, to be asked to be a part of this project, and I, you know, wish hearty congratulations to speaking volumes to to, to all those involved and all those who sacrificed and worked hard uh, in, in creating, you know, such wonderful literary uh, programs and projects for us to enjoy. If I never felt the brush of a trushy's wing. His pearly-eyed stare, his feathered splendor sings where a tree no longer stands. If I don't look again at the scars in this earth, at my stigmata skin, at the golden guava broken, its blood sugaring sweet the grass blades. We know the future forever happens. The book is open. This whole world is yours to imagine. All I know is it won't if you don't rise to see
to meet alive the firing sky. I'm Gail Sobwood. I live on Darug land in Blacktown, uh, Greater Sydney in Australia. I grew up working class, moving around various towns in Gippsland with my parents as they went from job to job. I lived for 20-something years in Botswana and spent some time in the UK and France. I founded Outlandish Arts, which is a disabled-led organisation that works with disabled artists to make art and create platforms for that art. I'm also a writer. I began writing short stories for publication in Botswana in the 1980s. I like the vibrancy of a short story. I explore sites of injustice. I explore love. I like to create characters who are not typical of those who are dominant in society. Um, I like to explore the myriad of ways people resist oppression and exploitation, the creative ways. After experiencing the 2019-2020 New South Wales fires, I feel an absolute urgency to write. Um, those fires all over Australia were unprecedented in their extent and their intensity. Those fires devastated trees and um, native growth. Um, the fires killed over 3 billion animals. Uh, air pollution levels were extreme in the cities, the towns, the countryside, rural areas. We're facing one crisis followed by another. Last month we experienced unprecedented rains and flooding, climate emergency, pandemics, increased poverty, um, politicians and political parties that are blatantly corrupt. Most of what I write now is apocalyptic. I write against the brutality of capitalism in crisis. I'm writing poems about our interconnectedness to microbiota, to trees and water and air, our interdependence. My writing is a battle cry. And I want to dedicate my old age, the rest of my life, to fighting for a more just loving and caring economic and social system and I will do this through my writing and my arts work. Gravelly voices from her collection of books resonate in the quiet in her skull. The world shall be turned into the old silence seven days no man shall remain a ragged mouthful of the stench of rotting flesh turns her stomach. Behind a fallen tree, she finds scorched fur, a kangaroo, his arms curled in submission, burnt to bone. Maggots squirm thick from within his guts. O stumbles, her left hand grabs hold of eucalyptus globidea. The trunk stops her fall, her heart beating against the stringy bark. It's scorched hardwood, intact, strong for now. The land shall be waste and untrodden, and men shall see it desolate. The days are coming when those who dwell on the earth shall be seized with great terror. There shall be chaos also in many places, and fire shall often break out. Seed pouches sway around her hips attached to her belt. Japanese prints with white cranes on a black background, traditional indigo sashiko, Dutch prints from Africa. Some are the faded colours of old saris. She guards her fabrics as jealously as she guards her books in her underground home. Her valuables collected during the days when women from around the world stood in solidarity with their struggle before nations turned inwards in fits of shriveling paranoia, before the watchers escaped to their new settlements on Mars. No spaceships now, no planes, no ships, just small boats that brave the angry seas. 
O sews her pouches by hand, small, fine stitches close together. She lines each pouch with pastel silk. Her breathing evens. She stretches her arms, looks up at the dirty sky and at the headless testament to a tree against which she leans. Canopies burnt to nothing, top kill. These trees have little chance of epicormic recovery. She bends her head, eyes wandering the ground, wedged under a blackened root like gum nuts. I see you, I see you little ones, she croons in low song, shaking some red-brown seeds into one of her pouches. She bends to lay the pods back down under the root on fertile cinders. I sing rain for you, I dance rain for you. And the earth shall restore those that are asleep in her, and so shall the dust those that dwell in silence, and the secret places shall deliver those souls that were committed unto them. A tree cracks like a stock whip and crashes down somewhere not too far away. Trees, bone dry from consecutive winters with little to no rain, topple, no warning, weakened by one fire after another. And they shall break down the cities and walls, mountains and hills, trees of the wood and grasses of the meadows. Something, someone, walks with heavy stride. O grabs her crutch and moves behind a large log, lays flat, rolls her brown arms in ash slowly, until they are the grey of the earth. A rogue watcher, who stinks of sour skin, unwashed, stomps up to the kangaroo, hacking, sucking, probably the tail, maybe the maggots. O oh, unsheaths a blade. The watcher mumbles, and the forest is quiet again for an instant, so close. A voice speaks, smooth and strong, like thick treacle in O's brain. The angel waiteth with a sword to cut thee in two and to destroy you. O thinks, I am that angel. I will cut the enemy in two. Trying to concentrate, straining now to listen to the watcher. Metal jabs cold and hard against the back of her head. Her mouth and tongue are gritty with dirt. Her lip splits, front tooth smashes against wood where there is a pleasant scent of burnt resin. I saw trees of judgment, especially vessels of the fragrance of incense and myrrh. I saw seven mountains full of fine nard and fragrant trees of cinnamon and pepper. Her mouth tastes of iron, blood. Oh, can't see her but realises by her voice and her way of talking that she and the watcher are probably about the same age. Most of the watchers bought tickets on the space shuttles, adapt, they said, and paid for expensive fireproof houses for themselves, and helicopter ships and underground compounds, and they plundered the earth and the rivers and the skies without mercy. Adapt. Of those who stayed, few survived. Only a few rogues remain. This was surely one. A trigger clicks. Everything is moving, changing. A war cry, guttural, but so loud the charcoal trees shudder. Explosion. O opens one eye to see blood trickling down the log. She doesn't feel any pain. Maybe she is an angel. A hand grabs her arm. O shrieks as she's pulled up onto her feet. Milindovu stands, muscled, dark, oiled skin, their black hair braided into a sculptured circle that stands upright at the back of their head. Tattooed circles on the left side of their face. A revolutionary Malo Kingi, small and lethal. And another voice from another book whispers, A cold sweat covers me, 
Trembling seizes my body, and I am greener than grass. Lacking but little of death do I seem. Millen Dovel holds O's arm too tight, glaring at her. Read my lips. Fireflies must always go out in pairs, twos, one plus one. A partner to keep an eye out for danger. There is a reason for the rule, yeah? They shove O's head so she's facing the watcher's body. A reason, right? O is surprised at how much the watcher looks just like her. Same golden brown skin, same kind of lanky, full lips, green eyes. But her hair's been cut short to the scalp. She's filthy and there's an ugly hole in her chest. How did you know I left the compound alone? O asks. Dinkum told me, Milandovu says, handing O her crutch. O bends over the watcher. Her hand touches the woman's breast, the thin cotton t-shirt warm beneath her fingers, down the curve of her hip, delving into pockets. She produces a pocket knife, a pen and a green stone. She holds the stone up to the sun and seems to be imbibing the colour. New leaf green, the green we need to see in our forests. The corners of her mouth lift slightly to suggest a smile. Her cheeks are plump, round. It's a healing gem, calming, she says lightly, touching the stone to Milandovo's lips. A stone of unconditional love, you feel it? Milandovo is still and silent, their face expressionless, their black eyes focused on O's. The colour matches your eyes, they finally say. Mm -hmm.